Honestly, you guys, this has been burning up inside of me for so long that I just have to say it. And like, I have to warn you, it's like the most brutal thing I've ever said about anyone ever. And at this point, it literally just needs to be said. In my opinion, Mackenzie Standifer is not- What's up, you guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on a single video. Now, let's jump right into it. The episode starts off with Farrah and her family still being in Key West, Florida, where she is still upset with her mother's fiance, David. She actually tried to extend an olive branch to David by asking her mom to ask David to come along kayaking with the family and though David does not get into the water like Simon he does come along to watch everyone at the beach or whatever that is. One thing I quickly have to say about that though is the way David speaks to Deborah is kind of disturbing to me and it seems like it's probably even worse off camera. He's extremely rude and condescending towards her especially when he's watching television. Things get actually a little bit worse when they're over um, by the water. In fact Farah and Deborah try to get his attention to tell him something and he's speaking to a random woman on the island and in like he wouldn't even like pause the conversation and turn around to address his future wife and stepdaughter and be like you know hang on one second someone's calling me like what is it that you need he just kept like ignoring them yelling his name or and trying to get his attention and at a certain point the lady kind of leaves him and again Deborah is yelling to him and this time he does turn around but it was like in a really like what the hell do you want kind of way and he gives her like a really short and rude response Farah peeps game and tells Deborah, listen you got to handle the way this man speaks to you because it's not like right it's not nice but Deborah kind of goes along for the ride because she does seem to be a little bit desperate at this point in her life so in the next scene over we're back in Tennessee where Macy and Keely sit down to talk about what else? Ryan. Macy complains that Ryan won't return her calls and she says that it's because he's a drug addict who doesn't care about anything or anyone else and she says that the situation is literally life or death. Over in Indiana, a male producer sits down with Gary and Christina to ask about how the custody thingy is going with Amber and so Gary says things were going pretty great after Easter but some rumors have been happening around town that are preventing him from wanting Leah to spend any more time with Amber and Matt. Now a Teen Mom 2 and Teen Mom OG crossover happens when we jet on over to LA with Amber where she's preparing to attend the MTV Movie Awards for whatever reason and Teen Mom 2's Kaylin Larry is in the glam room getting ready with her. You guys, I find that I have to adapt to Kale's like really harsh and like gruff voice. I was like, you know, getting myself comfortable in my chair with my snacks, like, you know, sipping a glass of water and Kale starts speaking and I was like, Whoa. You know, like she is so rough in the way she speaks. Like basically, I think the first thing she said to Amber was, what are you guys getting married? Like, I don't know why, but Kayla is always barking when she speaks to people and it scares the shit out of me. It's literally like she was taught to speak by a couple of pit bulls or something. And you guys, either there is something wrong with Kayla's head or she secretly despises Amber because as Amber is like visibly like depressed and sad and like anxiety ridden over her relationship, which anyone can tell is, you know, super abusive and just trash um kale tells her all these like really really stupid things like i can't picture you with anyone else i want you guys to get married there's nothing wrong with the fact that he's 20 years older than you with like a kid your age and like multiple other unclaimed children running across america with no job to speak of you know there's nothing wrong with the fact that he moved into your house off a couch in boston the first day he met you even though you had a young daughter to protect like this interaction was straight up crazy and let me just point something else out it is funny to me that kale would advocate for amber to put up with a laundry list of baggage bullshit and abuse whereas kale can easily drop any relationship in her life in two seconds over literally nothing like you know javi looked at me the wrong way one time or javi asked me to have a baby or joe you know doesn't bow down to me when i bark all these demands at him or jordan you know isn't excited to me anymore let me drop it but amber has to fight through all this bullshit kale why don't you take some of your relationship advice and you know kind of stick through a relationship then if that's how you feel about them in michigan caitlin heads over to the horse table and remember she's been trying to kind of convince tyler and the audience that like she hasn't been able to let this whole horse thing go because horses are her passion and her life you know she won't get bored of it and throw it away she'll feed it she'll like groom it and all that shit but as soon as she gets on over to the ranch the ranch man spills her tea by saying this, 
Long time no see, Caitlin. I was like, you know what? If I were Caitlin, I'd be a little embarrassed that this man's over here spilling my tea for the world to see. Back in Florida, Farah, Deborah, Simon, and Sophia head over to a nail salon and they're getting their mini pedis done when um, Farah asked Deborah what she's planning to do to kind of smooth over the relationship Deborah has with Farah because he's always hated her and all sorts of things like that. Farah literally tells Deborah that it's fucked up, that she wants to marry someone who literally hates her daughter and is giving her the cold shoulder on her very own vacation. Deborah says that different people handle stress differently. Farah says that being a doctor, especially a psychologist or whatever, or a psychiatrist, David should be able to handle stress better than anyone. And so Deborah again tries to mediate a little bit by offering different kinds of suggestions, but Farah is having none of it. She claims that she's the easiest. Actually, sorry, it was Simon. Simon tries to mediate a little bit by offering suggestions on how the two of them can get along a little bit better, but Farah's having none of it. And she says that she is the easiest person in the world to get along with, and Simon laughs his ass off. Farah then ironically claims that she personally would never ever in her life put up with someone who treated her who treated her mom the way that David treats her, which is kind of ironic because Simon, who she, you know, reportedly is still with, has taken to social media to call her mom delusional, insane, batshit crazy, and even a hooker. So pot, kettle, anyone? anyone anyway in her usual childish tone Deborah says that all of the stress is just too much for her to the point where she doesn't even want to exist anymore while her granddaughter is sitting right next to her what is Sophia seven eight years old that was way too much to throw at her first of all this whole entire conversation was too much to have in front of Sophia but that alone was team too much and um, actually it gets a little bit worse because Farrah kind of pokes her a little bit more about the the hostility between herself and David and so Deborah's like well now it makes me want to die and the camera pans over to Sophia who's just sitting there like you know like blank and just obviously visibly upset and Farrah notices this and asks Sophia if she wants to go outside but Sophia's just so like kind of stunned at this moment and she doesn't even like respond at all okay you guys the drama is really amping up right now as Macy is concerned about Ryan's you know sobriety little Miss Mackenzie is just lounging around out front of Ryan's house you know looking ditzy as hell like uh, laughing and giggling about how she wants to marry Ryan that very day she's calling in about like renting a dress and asking about a marriage license and all of that. And so when a producer asks her what's going on, she claims that they need to get married um, in order to help Ryan's bid for more custody of Bentley. Apparently it would look really good if a drag addict married some random chick like a couple months into meeting her, right? So that's why they want to get married that day. And though I do believe that in Ryan's cooped up like mind, he does think that's what's going to happen. In Mackenzie's sober mind, she's more like, I'm trying to get my teen mom coins. You know, I'm trying to solidify my place here. You know, I think they had two very different motives in this situation. After Mackenzie and the producer talk, Ryan gets up on the porch looking fucked up as hell. He's got one big eye, one small eye. They're going in different directions. When one goes north, the other goes south. When one goes east, the other goes west. They are avoiding each other like the Bloods and the Crips, y'all. And so he's sitting there talking to Mackenzie like, we gonna get married today. We gonna get married today right I'm so excited like he looks like you know like what a, a vegetable or a barely functioning person is speaking like to me I'm thinking this person is out of his mind and everybody knows it and sees it right like you literally cannot do anything with the person in this state much less have them marry you so I don't understand how this was even like possible and especially as a mother like why would Mackenzie want to bring her own son into this knowing that you know the mother of Ryan's son is trying to like protect her, her son at all costs and get him out of the situation situation why are you trying to drag your own child into it it literally makes zero sense and like Ryan literally looked like he could have dropped and blacked out at any damn second and Mackenzie obviously noticed this because she was visibly agitated with him as well and side note it looks like Ryan may not even just be abusing opium if you look at his arm in this scene, it looks like he's got a puncture wound from a little something something that I like to call heroin. After they finalize a conversation, like confirming that they're going to be getting married later that day, um, Ryan's like, oh my god, I need to get a baby, I need to get a haircut. And so he just jets on off and carries a backpack. And I'm sitting here like, 
what do you need that backpack for, boo? Like, listen, I got a lot more hair than you and I do not need to bring a damn backpack when I go to get my hair done. Like, why did you need a backpack? If I had to guess, I thought like that was his little stash of drugs that he was carrying around and you know, the barber was code for a little something else. The fact that not only production allowed him to drive in that visibly like strung out state, is bad enough but to make matters worse like this woman who's about to become his wife who's supposed to love and care for him and like have his back and look out for him is allowing him to do that and like we it, like we can't even pretend that Mackenzie did not know he was fucked up like it is so beyond obvious even in the way she speaks to him she's like speaking to him like man wake the f up like don't do this to me on camera and, and you know in that sort of way so like for her to even allow him to drive like that and not even offer to drive her it's not, like I mean what else is the girl doing all day right like why wouldn't she offer to drive the whole situation just left me feeling really uneasy meanwhile in LA Amber seems to be relieving all the text messages floating around about Matt like guys remember in my videos a few like videos prior we talked about a girl named Tiffany who leaked all sorts of text messages between herself and Matt herself and Kiki herself and Jeff I believe and some DICK pics of Matt as well and so this is presumably what Amber's talking about and so she claims that if they are in fact true she's gonna leave him and Matt volunteered to do a lie detector test about the whole thing and then as she's kind of considering what would happen if they were true and they had to separate she's like well shoot we've got all these bills in like common names he's got his name on the house along with me he's got his name on the bank account along with me and all this stuff and so Kiki is obviously looking at her like you dumb bitch but she's kind of like trying to be optimistic for Amber she's like you know I mean at least it's better than not you know at least it's better than it being solely in his name on the bright side and then Amber does this signature thing where she tries to cry especially over her daughter she's like this would be so sad for Leah they're so close Oh my god and like as usual no tears are coming out so she's kind of left to look like at the end of a really dramatic scene of a telenovela right she's like this would be so sad for Leah they were so close and then she hugs Kiki like this with her face just looking really weird and she freezes like that for the you know transition of the scenes but the producer in this scene kept this going a little bit too long and I felt kind of uncomfortable about it. You guys can we talk about how strange this next scene between Caitlyn and Tyler was? The two of them mentioned buying four ducks who have like pretty quickly escaped from them and then they're like yeah like these ducks escaped I, you know it's not new or anything sometimes they hide under the house Sometimes they're in that other like barn thing. And so now we don't really know where they are. And in the middle of talking about this, Tyler's like in the background on the computer looking at clothes for that like Tierra Rain or whatever thing. And so he's like, oh yeah, these ducks are lost. By the way, Kate, look at this little outfit. Wouldn't it be cute for our clothing line? And I was just like, Bitch, what? After this, the two of them are like, you know what? We looked at our little clothing line enough. Let's go feed our chickens out front, out back. And so they go out back and start feeding their chickens. And they don't even think to look for these damn ducks. They're just sitting around feeding chickens, looking at the eggs they're hatching and stuff. And then they go, fuck these ducks, man. Why don't we buy a horse? And then lucky for them, but unlucky for the ducks, the ducks were found um, trying to escape through the back of like a fence of theirs. And so Caitlin and D Tyler kind of corner them and bring them back into the home. And so they notice that of the four ducks that they have, only three of them made it. And so Tyler casually throws something a little disturbing out. He's like, oh wow, you know what? We're missing a duck. But in fact, I'm kind of surprised that we've got these other three. We should be happy considering we've got these predatory like chicken hawks or whatever running around that I thought had killed them all by now like you know that there are predators like swarming your compound that could kill your ducks but you don't bother to safely secure them how does that work? Next up, MTV flashes a huge warning about the upcoming scene involving Ryan and Mackenzie and Macy that, say, that says it's going to be really disturbing and difficult for us to watch. And so I'm sitting here thinking, oh, we're finally going to see him ac like accidentally do drugs on camera. You know, like, let me just sit up straight and take this next scene in. Instead of what I thought we were gonna see, we're greeted by a scene of Mackenzie going to the bridal salon, rushing on over there to rent a dress to marry her stoned cash cow in and then we head on over to Ryan's parents house where he goes wow like a two-year-old when he sees her in a dress not in this romantic groom getting married kind of way and she's like thank ya I'm about to take all your money get in the car so they get in the car together and you guys like I didn't even really notice that he was still super effed up 
until this scene happens. Ryan asks Mackenzie if he can drop by TJ Maxx so that he can pick up like a bow tie for this little shotgun sidewalk wedding and Mackenzie snaps at him. She's like, duh, it's 6.09 and we were supposed to get married at 6 o'clock. No. And so he's like, I was just joking as he's like getting really drowsy his eyes are closing and he's like driving at this point he still has his sunglasses on so you'd have to be really squinting and paying attention to like how limp his arm is getting to notice how bad the whole situation is like the guy is literally shaking his head like trying to snap out of it and wake up to pay attention to the road and unfortunately he couldn't and he literally falls asleep behind the wheel his head drops all the way back and he still has his like arm on the seat and like his eyes are just like so gross and literally Mackenzie sees this and all she could focus on is marrying this guy at this point instead of being like oh my god pull over stop like you're, you're too high for this or you're too anything like for the safety of not only Ryan but her own self and the people on the road literally Mackenzie seemed to have no respect for anybody in the world at this moment not even herself at the very least like this girl was so desperate to marry Ryan that she grabbed the steering wheel from him and started trying to steer for herself because he was so high as she tried tries to wake him up. I was, am I really, is this real life? Is someone really this desperate? Like the whole thing was so terrifying to witness. Your soon to be husband is passed out behind the wheel and you know it's because of a drug addiction and you know it's dangerous to drive under the influence but instead of just like pausing or freaking out or even trying to call the damn thing off especially with young kids at stake you are so desperate for tv fame and money that you take the wheel from him and try to lean on over, I had to pause the scene. And you know what I did, you guys? I sent a clip that Anon Mafioso posted on Twitter to like my booski. I was like, listen, dude, can you see what's going on here? Tell me I'm not overreacting. Like, is this girl psychotic or is she psychotic? On a scale of one to 10, I was a 10,000 in terms of how like shocked, disgusted, enraged I was watching the scene. All I could think was, is this really the person that you are jumping into a marriage with? Like you wanna marry someone as they're this strung out on your wedding day. You wanna be this stressed out. You you know, you're driving to a venue not even knowing whether you're going to make it there alive. How desperate are you as such a young woman? How desperate are you that this is what you want to do with your life? And how do you care about someone that you wanna marry so little that you, you know, can't even think about their safety at all. All you're thinking is of like punching him awake, you know, bitching at him, snapping at him. Tell me I'm not crazy when I say this because you know what, you guys, I have to say something that I've never said about anybody ever, ever, ever because I've never been this done. Like, you know, the whole Amber beating Gary thing was awful. The whole Janelle and K Kiefer having their little heroin doze off was awful and disturbing. But this scene is probably the, it beats them in terms of d disturbing disgustingness level because not only are we seeing um, an addict pass out we're also seeing someone take full-blown advantage of them honestly you guys this has been burning up inside of me for so long that I just have to say it and like I have to warn you it's like the most brutal thing I've ever said about anyone ever and at this point it literally just needs to be said in my opinion Mackenzie Standifer is nothing but a straight up predator. To me, she is on the level of Jodi Arias or Arias or however you pronounce it. Like what she exhibited here was straight up, in my opinion again, sociopathy, psychopathy, like so selfish, so disgusting and so despicable. And you know why I'm saying this? Because you guys, you cannot even have sex with someone in this state, right? Because they are so out of it. And to do that would be raping them and taking advantage of them. And it would make you a really disgusting, like unconscionable person. Like, you know what I mean? So for her to go and marry someone in this state, risk his life, her life, the whole road's life, makes her a straight up disgusting predator to me. And if this is how far she would go to land this guy, there is no telling what the limit is for this disgusting, like horrible, despicable, like shell of a person, especially, especially in light of the fact that she's got her own child to worry about. Like, honestly, I hope her ex-husband watched this scene and get Gets her child the hell away from her because she in my opinion is a straight up predator she is twisted she is evil she is conniving she is just disturbing how Macy and Ryan's parents like her and trust her is beyond me because like I said earlier 
you cannot have sex with someone in this state of mind because they are not there, okay? Ryan was like on the level of a, a retarded person or a vegetable. So for her to try and marry him in the state and not try and marry him, but to marry him in the state and force him to continue driving her to the sidewalk altar is just reprehensible. I have. I've never been so disgusted by a person um, on this show in my life. Like, I, she's, she's disgusting. She literally acted like nothing but a savage, stone-cold gold digger with a life insurance policy on Ryan who does not care whether he's dead or alive. You know, she acted like someone who wanted to marry a reality television star with lots of money at all costs. And you guys, I keep saying this a thousand times because it is so shocking. Instead of asking him to pull over so she could drive them safely to their little sidewalk wedding where she could still marry him under the influence, she, you know, kept punching him to wake up. And at a certain point, she was so fed up with him making her look bad on camera that she tries to unplug all of the cameras. But thankfully for us, her stupid ass forgot she was still mic'd up when she asked him whether or not he was on Xanax and I was like listen girl you know damn well this guy is on a lot more than fucking Xanax okay and while I'm happy that MTV issued a disclaimer both before and after this driving scene I do have to say that yet again they're exhibiting double standards between um, the men and the women of this show because we also have seen Leah nod off behind the wheel while she was actually driving children both of her twins um, and there were no warning scenes you know anything like that so I do have to point out the double standard in that respect and also adding on top of that on top of this driving under the influence thing being condoned by Mackenzie and producers um, I have to note that neither of them were even wearing seatbelts throughout the entire scene like what gives with these people like there's they literally have no brain cells anyway you guys like I said this episode was so big so heavy that I have to break out my review in two parts just to really tear into the disgusting scene that was Mackenzie forcing Ryan to drive to their wedding high as a kite strung out out of his mind um, let me just end this part one here while I get ready to upload a part two for you guys let me know all your thoughts and opinions on what you saw in this um, episode of Teen Mom OG's season finale. Were you as disturbed as I was? Do you think I'm going too far by calling Mackenzie an attention whoring gold digger who potentially has a life insurance policy out on Ryan because I, you know, that, that's how I feel at this moment. But if you think I'm going too far, let me know in the comment section down below. Um, as always, you guys, I'm more excited to hear what you have to say about all of this. Leave all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. And as usual, we'll chat. In the upcoming part two, we're gonna talk about them actually making it down the sidewalk aisle and um, discuss whether or not Ryan can even legally enter into a, a marriage contract in this state of mind. Wouldn't this kind of be considered um invalid as usual make sure you like this video subscribe for more feel free to share it with your friends as well and follow me across social media where i absolutely love chatting with you that's all for now thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time